Welcome back, Wally. Okay, I think we are on eight o'clock, so if I can just begin by making an announcement, if everyone can mute yourselves, unless you want to speak at the end. Um, first, I wanted to announce and to say that Rosh Hashanah is happening on Friday night, in case anybody didn't hear. Um, and there's a lot of activity taking place in preparation. So if anybody is able to come to Shul, please make a booking. There are certain services that are already full. The president's message of more than 50 people only happens after Rosh Hashanah, so we have a variety of services at different times and places. So please book if you haven't done so already. If you're unable to come to shul in any way, please message me and I'm going to try and find a way of somebody blowing shofar at your home. Um, the Chabad network is actually covering all the neighborhoods and I'll be doing this neighborhood and other people doing other neighborhoods. So. If you can notify me if you need somebody to blow shofar for you at home, please do so, and we're going to make every attempt to have somebody come to you to blow shofar. There is a shofar blowing service, in fact, two, just for shofar on Sunday afternoon. There's no shofar on, on Shabbat. On Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock, and again at 4.30, there'll be a 15-minute session outside the shul um, in the tent, one of the venues at the shul and you could bring your children to that event. Children are otherwise not catered to um, this year in the shul with all the requirements, but that four o'clock and 4.30 on Sunday afternoon, which is for people that are unable to come to the other services because the morning services will include the blowing of the shofar. But if you're not gonna be able to be there at either eight o'clock or 11 o'clock, the various times in the afternoon, there's gonna be a shofar blowing which children can also attend, but you need to book because there are also maximums and processing of people that will come to hear that blowing of the shofar. I want to wish everyone a ktibaba khatima I'll clarify before next week, next Wednesday, when Rabbi Simpson will again give a class on preparing for the magza on your kippah, and we'll clarify the time so there's no confusion. And also to announce that tomorrow night, we have the online service from the Great Park, there's some magnificent features from our choir with some beautiful footage also from our children. So please join us tomorrow night. I've sent the links out um, for the online service that is taking place. I'm now going to hand over to Rabbi Simpson. I'm asking everyone to please mute yourselves. And uh, thank you, Rabbi Simpson. Thank you very much, Rabbi Hazan. Um, good evening and welcome to our journey through the central prayers of Rosh Hashanah. Um, if anybody has a, a machzer with them, um, you can follow along with the machzer. I'm, I'm going to be using the art scroll machzer. Um, apologies for all those using uh, the Birnbaum and the, and the Adler and the others and the Koren. Um, but I'm going to be giving out the page numbers for the, uh, for, for the art scroll. It's not essential, but it may help to, to follow along. Now, when, when preparing for tonight's shir, I came across a very beautiful parable by the Baal Shem Tif, which really encapsulates the situation in which we find ourselves. The Baal Shem Tif says, it was once uh, the lion, the king of the jungle, and he was, um, for some reason, he, he was furious with all of the other jungle animals. He became upset. Now, the animal said, uh, what what should we do? They had a meeting. What should we do? The lion gets angry. When he gets angry, it's not good for any of us. So the fox said, don't worry about it, he says. He says, I've got 300 stories and jokes and anecdotes to entertain the lion to cheer him up, and, and I'll, I'll solve this issue. It won't be a problem. So the animals embarked on, uh, on their march towards the, the lion's den, and as they were on the journey, the, the fox suddenly turns to uh, one of his animal friends and says, as you know, uh, I've got some bad, I've, I forgot a hundred of my entertaining stories. 
people started worrying a bit, but the bear said, don't worry, he says, you've got 200 stories. All right, 200 stories are enough to, uh, to get the, uh, the lion excited, and that should be sufficient. Okay, they continue on their journey, and the entourage becomes bigger and bigger. And uh, as they're nearing the lion's den, the fox turns, I've got some more bad news, because I've forgotten a hundred of my anecdotes. My animals uh, started getting a bit worried, but the deer reassured them. And the deer said, don't worry, he says, a hundred uh, stories from the fox should be sufficient to capture the imagination of the king, and uh, we'll be fine. A few moments later, hundreds of animals at the door of the lion's den. The moment of truth arrived, and uh, they all turned to the fox, and they said, all right, let's go. You know, please approach the lion and uh, accomplish your mission of reconciliation. <laughs> at that moment, the fox turns to the animals and says, I'm sorry, but I forgot my last hundred stories. I've got nothing to tell the king. The animals started, uh, they were frightened, said, you're a liar. You deceived us. What do I do now? So the fox turns to them and says, listen here, folks, he says, my job was to persuade you to take this journey from your own home, from your nests, to the lion's den. And I've accomplished my mission. You're all here. But now, each and every one of you needs to discover their own voice and begin to reconcile themselves with the lion, with the king, and rehabilitate your per personal relationship with the king. And the Hashemta says that this story illustrates a very, a very common problem in uh, institutionalized religion, which most of us are members of. You know, when we come to Shul and Rashad and Kippur, Shabbos even, during the week, oftentimes we rely on the fox, the chazan, the rabbi. You know, there are representatives to, uh, to the king, to the king of kings. And uh, we put it on their shoulder. We say, don't worry, they'll take care of it. They'll do it on our behalf. But sooner or later, we come to realize that uh, the fox doesn't always have all the answers. They don't always have what it takes to represent us before the king of kings. And each of us has to discover our own inner voice and our own passion and our own spirit to speak to Hashem in our own unique way. And I think this is all the more important uh, this year when... Uh, for those of us who are going to be davening at home, we're not going to be able to convince ourselves that uh, the rabbi or the chazan is uh, davening on our behalf. We're going to be home. And even those who are going to be in shul, you know, the format's going to be different. It's not going to have the same, uh, the same number of people. We're not going to have all the trappings, all the trimmings, the ambiance, the, the, the environment. And it's really going to be up to all of us to, to, to uh, appreciate the prayers and to take the initiative to develop that relationship on our own. Now, we're going to go through the essential prayers. We're not going to go through the entire tefillah. And we're not going to go through even the essential prayers that we do cover. We're not going to go through it word for word. But really an overview of the theme of the prayer, its uh, significance. And... And uh, because of the Shabbos, there are certain additions and certain omissions in the davening. Uh, most obvious is the lack of shofar blowing on the first day, but there are others as well. And we'll point that, uh, we'll point that out as well. So many of you may have received the, um, the, the pamphlets from the show with the magazine. Included in there is a bookmark which contains the essential prayers. And in fact, I'm going to be following those prayers. So it's those prayers on the bookmark that I'm going to try and cover today, which are really, you know, the, which is really the bulk, the, 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 the essential, so to speak, of the Rosh Hashanah prayer. So we'll start with the evening prayer. Um, the evening prayer starts on the art scroll on page, um, page 52. And being that it is Shabbos, we begin with Mizmar Shir Leoma Shabbos. Uh, sorry, it's on page... Uh, page 46, apologies, page 46, Mizmar Shiliyama Shabbos, which is the song of Shabbos. It's the onset of Rosh Hashanah, which coincides with the onset of Shabbos, and uh, we need to make mention of that. So we recite that psalm that 
is associated with Shabbos. And you'll notice that we omitted the Lechadoidi and all the other uh, elements of Kabbalat Shabbat, which traditionally are done on a Friday night. Some communities say it, but we don't. And um, in effect, we, we abridge that dimension of the service and focus primarily on the Rosh Hashanah aspect. But together with that, we do mention the fact that it's Shabbos by reciting that Psalm, Psalm 92, which is a Psalm for Shabbos. And then we move on to page 52, which is the reciting of the Shema. Now, these are not prayers which are unique to Shabbat, but to, uh, to Rosh Hashanah, I'm sorry but are essential in that they are a mitzvah to be recited on a daily basis. The reciting of the Shema is a daily requirement in the evening and in the morning. But interestingly, it takes on a much more powerful meaning on Rosh Hashanah. Because one of the underlying themes of Rosh Hashanah is the idea of accepting Kabbalat HaMalchut, reenacting the coronation of Hashem that took place 5,782 years ago. And this notion, this idea, is really the essence of Shema. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alekein, Hashem Echad. So it's really an opportune time to reflect on the theme of Shema and how it relates to Rosh Hashanah as the day in which we are coronating Hashem, the day in which we are making Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem our God, in a, in a new way, in a more powerful way, in a more, in a more real way. So we recite the Shema, which begins on page 52, and there are the three chapters. Uh, Shema, Bahayim, Shema, and Yomer. And there are obviously the blessings before and after, but as I said, I'm only mentioning the essential prayers. Uh, don't get me wrong. If you want to say the other prayers, go, go right ahead. And I think, uh, as they say in Hebrew, Tavo, Allah, Bracha, may you be blessed. But uh, we're going to cover the essentials. Now we move to the Amidah on page 62. Now the Amidah, is uh, one that follows the standard format of Amida. This is a topic for discussion on itself, the format of the Amida. But in general, there is a standard format which runs through all the Amidas, whether it's during the week, whether it's on Shabbat, whether it's on the festivals. The standard format is there are three blessings of praise in the beginning, which I think many of us are familiar with. You know. Etc. And it concludes with three blessings of, of thanksgiving. And what changes is the middle of the prayer, which is tailored to the day. So the middle blessings would be different, whether it's a weekday, where we ask for our personal needs, or Shabbat, where we speak about the sanctity of Shabbos, or Rosh Hashanah, where we talk about the themes of Rosh Hashanah. So the theme of the day is emphasized in this middle blessing or blessings, depending on, uh, on the day. And this Amidah, the Amidah that we're going to be reciting on Rosh Hashanah, um, will be the same Amidah in the evening prayer, and in the morning prayer, and in the afternoon prayer. So I'm not going to uh, you know, cover it three times, but it's, a, it's the same prayer. Just as on a regular weekday, we say the same Amidah for Shacharit, Mincha, Ma'ariv, for morning, afternoon, evening prayers. On Rosh Hashanah, it's the same Amidah prayer for the morning, afternoon, and evening. The exception is the Musaf prayer, which we'll get to soon, where there are additional sections which we'll talk about later. But uh, for Shacharit, for Mayriv, Shacharit Samincha, it's the standard format. And if you look at page 64, this is where things begin to change a bit. You know, the standard conclusion of the third blessing is Ata Kadosh, Shimcha Kadosh. But at this point, we veer off course and begin to talk about the holiness of the day, the holiness of Rosh Hashanah. And you'll notice on page 64 that there are four paragraphs which start with the words, Uvechein, well, actually three. Starting at page 64 and continuing on page 66. Uvechein, Teng Pachtacha, Uvechein, Teng Kabod, Uvechein, Sadikim, the Timloch, and these paragraphs, this introduction, and in fact, the bulk, a very powerful message about how we need to think of our mission in this world, especially on Rosh Hashanah, which is in fact the birthday of the human being. So on our birthday, on the birthday of humanity, is the time when we focus on our mission in the world. And this theme plays its thought in somewhat of a poetic way, and you sort of got to read between the lines, but there's an important message. The first paragraph 
speaks about the awesomeness of Hashem's revelation and manifested in a revealed way at the very beginning of creation. When Hashem created the world at first, it was a beautiful world. It was a world that was aware of its, of its source, aware of divinity. It was in awe of Hashem's majesty. And if you read the, the, the text, it talks about this idea of all creatures prostrating themselves before you, becoming a single society, sort of a utopia, which was the world at its very inception, at its very beginning. But then you continue in the second paragraph, which talks about, it begins with the words, Hashem, grant honor to your people and to those who revere you. Because with time, this revelation was, was diminished through the mysteries, through the challenges that our ancestors and indeed ourselves that we went through. And godliness, which was so revealed initially, was concealed. And uh, we as a people are tasked with the goal, with the mission of bringing light back into this world. So we turn to Hashem and say, grant us honor, give us the strength of character and the we're with all to see out our mission to bring light into this world, to recreate the Garden of Eden in this world. And this follows with the next two paragraphs, which talk about a world in which the righteous will see and will be glad and the wickedness will evaporate and Hashem will reign. Essentially, this is the conclusion or the fulfillment of the objective which we put into this world. When we achieve what we need to achieve, the simlei chata Hashem levadef, the new Hashem, will rule alone. Hashem's presence, the revelation of spirituality will be such that it will sort of reintroduce Hashem's presence as it was at the very beginning of creation. So essentially, this is the mission statement of humanity, to bring godliness back into this world the way it was at the very, at the very beginning. And with this, we continue on page 68 with the sanctification of the day, which is really standard for the festivals. It talks about Hashem has given us the festivals. We ask Hashem for blessings for life and for goodness, both materially and spiritually. And the, the, the space 68 and 70, all the way till the end, are really sort of standard festival prayers. And it concludes with the same Thanksgiving prayer, which I said in the beginning, is the standard conclusion of every fest of every Amida. So once again, we have Standard beginning, standard end. The beginning starts with the importance of the mission of humanity. It follows with the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sanctity of the festival, what the festival is all about, with the conclusion. Now, we're just about finished the uh, evening prayer, but there's one more thing which we say unique to Rosh Hashanah. Now, just before that, it's important to note that because it's Shabbos on page 76, we are going to say Vayuchulu, which is the excerpt from the book of Genesis, which talks about creation, which interestingly, you know, creation is really the theme of Rosh Hashanah as well, but we're going to mention it with respect to Shabbat. And also within the Amida, there are various shaded boxes, um, which, um, which you'll have to note, which uh, are inserted because of Shabbos, and oftentimes we'll just add the fact that it's Shabbos in the, in, in the prayer. So it's just important to, uh, to pay attention to that. Moving on to page 78, something quite fascinating. This is the only festival where we say Psalm 24 just before the conclusion. And our sages tell us that it's a schus, it's a merit to say this Psalm for success in Parnassim, in livelihood, in business. Why? So the theme of this prayer is that everything comes from Hashem. In fact, the first words are La Hashem, Ha'aretz Himalaya, that to Hashem belongs the world and everything that is within it. And this really is the key to success. We need to recognize that our endeavors, that our business ventures are, are vessels to receive the blessings from Hashem. The blessings Blessings come from Hashem, the wealth, the presence. We need to make a vessel to receive those blessings. And how do we make that vessel? That vessel is made when we realize the true reality of the source of our blessing. When we realize that everything comes from Hashem, that is the channel through which we can ensure that the vessels which we make, which is going to work and doing what we need to do, that our vessels will achieve what it needs to do and receive the waters of blessings from Hashem. 
And interestingly, he mentions there, you know, people, a person with a clean heart and a pure, and a clean hands and a pure heart will climb the mountain of success, a mountain of Hashem. You know, oftentimes we think that our success is a result of our, our of, of, of entirely of our work. And we begin to engage in behavior, which maybe is contrary to having clean, clean hands and a pure heart. But when we recognize that it comes from Hashem, we realize that that is the road to success. We'll, we'll make sure that the road that we take is one of cleanliness and purity. Um, and the, doing it the way that I should do. Which is the so this is really the, the, the essential prayers of the evening. The um, it's the Mizmor uh, Shir Liyama Shabbat, the Shema, and the Amida, and Psalm 24. Now, moving right along, we go to the morning prayer, which is on page. I'm going a bit quick. I'm mean, obviously uh, there's a lot to talk about on each topic, but we're going to try to cover as much ground as we can. We move to page 182. The morning blessings. The Jewish way we start our day is with gratitude. That's the Jewish way to start a day. We thank Hashem for the simple yet uh, essential things in life. And this, I think, is a very good time to make a New Year's resolution to recite these blessings on a daily basis because, you know, it can really transform your day. When you wake up in the morning and you thank Hashem for those basic things, for sight, for the ability to hear, the ability to walk, it really makes one's day a different day because we appreciate all the small things or small but large things in life. So, especially in Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of the year, it's really an opportune time to begin uh, such a practice and to start with the daily blessings, uh, which would really be the beginning of, of every day. Then, move along to, um, to Shema. Also, as we mentioned, Shema is important to be recited every morning and evening. So we recite Shema in the morning. It's on page 290. So I, you see I skipped quite a lot, but uh, we're trying to keep it to the essentials. And then there is the Amida, which I'm not going to repeat. It's exactly the same Amida as the morning. And this is uh, as the evening, I'm sorry. And this is on page 296. The Amida, identical. Now, uh, <coughs> Generally, there is, at this point, the repetition of the Amida, which contains various different poems that were composed by uh, Jewish poets throughout history, primarily during medieval times. But um, I think the, even, it's, it's not, we're not going to be covering that uh, tonight. Um, I'd recommend you try and read through the Machser and just try to familiarize yourself with some of them. Some of them are quite powerful. Uh, quite, uh, quite, quite fascinating. Now, at the conclusion of the Amida, your personal Amida, we recite the Avinu Malkeinu. Now, it's important to note that on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, we don't say Avinu Malkeinu because it's Shabbat, and on Shabbat we omit Avinu Malkeinu. In fact, uh, we we don't we don't mention you know we don't uh, talk about uh, our sins. We don't ask Hashem for many personal requests. So a lot of that is included in the Avinu Malkeinu, and we skip that on, on Shabbat. But on the second day, we will say it. And uh, Avinu Malkeinu is one of these classic high holiday prayers. It's an ancient prayer going back to the times of the Talmud, over 2,000 years ago. And the Talmud tells us a story of uh, sages who were experiencing a drought. There was no rain. And they began to pray, as is the Jewish custom, you know, turn to Hashem for prayer, for, for rain. And there was no answer. The, pray, the rain wasn't coming. Until one of the sages began to recite a prayer, beginning with the words of Vinu Malkeinu, our father, our king. At which point, the heavens opened, began to rain, and the crops were saved, and the population was able to, uh, to survive uh, and to, uh, to thrive. And from then on, this prayer was adopted as a prayer to be said during times of challenge, as well as during the high holidays when we ask Hashem to bless us with a new year. So, you know, I think just personally, what really touches me about this prayer is its simplicity. You know, throughout the high holidays, we have many prayers that are very poetic, very complex, 
In fact, I'll tell you a secret. You know, I'll tell you, most, most, uh, most people who've gone through yeshiva, even most rabbis, don't really understand a lot of the uh, liturgy of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, a lot of the prayers, because it's written, it's written in a very poetic Hebrew, which they don't teach us in yeshiva, unfortunately. So it's not, even, it's not a biblical Hebrew, it's not even a rabbinic Hebrew, it's a very complicated Hebrew, and it's one that, uh, you know, you need, you need a, a, an English translation to really understand a lot of the uh, more intricate, complex prayers. But Avim al is a very simple prayer. Um, you know, we, we turn to Hashem as a child turns to, uh, to a parent, and we say, Hashem, listen here, we've done something wrong. We have no king beside you. It's very simple, short, um, short, uh, short statements and short requests. We're sort of peeling away all the complexity and getting down to tachlis, as they say. And when we get down to the bottom of it all, we turn to Hashem as children turn to their parents. And we ask Hashem, seal us for a good year for no other reason than the fact that you are our father and you are our king. The Baal Shem Tev has a very interesting statement. The Baal Shem Tev says that the simplicity of the soul can touch the simplicity of the divine. There are different dimensions of the soul, complex dimensions. There are different dimensions of godliness. If you want to touch the essence of Hashem, you've got to touch the essence of your soul. Your essence of your soul communicates directly to Hashem. And I think this prayer is really a manifestation of that. It's where the individual turns to Hashem and says, Pat, my father, I need this, I need this. Please bless me for a new year. And it's a very powerful prayer. I think a very poignant one. One that personally, you know, it, it, really, it, it really talks to me. After Avinu Malkeinu, we have the Torah reading. Now, even if you're not going to be in Shul, I would recommend that you read through the uh, readings for the day. The Shulchan Aruch says that one should, even if you're not going to hear it in the Shul, you should read, you know, the, uh, the Torah reading. So Rosh Hashanah, you should do the same as well. And the first day of Rosh Hashanah, read about the, it's, uh, in your master, you can find the reading on page 402. Once again, it's in the bookmark that you've got as well, so you don't have to write down the numbers. Um, and uh, we read the Torah reading on day one, which is the birth of Isaac, of Yitzchak. So it tells us that Avram and Sarah did not have any children. And uh, our sages tell us that their prayers, or particularly her prayer, was answered and she was remembered by Hashem on the day of Rosh Hashanah, that she conceived on the day of Rosh Hashanah. So as a result, our sages instituted to incorporate that Torah reading on Rosh Hashanah, even though, you know, ostensibly there's no, there's no connection between, um, between that story and Rosh Hashanah per se, but because, that, because those events transpired on that day, it was, uh, it, was, um, it, was, um, it was made as the Torah reading. Furthermore, I think just, just reading through the story, you know, you, it, it, it's really a, one that is very apropos for Rosh Hashanah about asking Hashem for our personal needs, for our requests, for children, etc., which is really an important element of, of Rosh Hashanah. The Haftorah, I think, is one of the most powerful Haftorahs that we read throughout the year. It's a story of Chana, who also was struggling for children and was remembered on this day and gave birth to a son who became the prophet Shmuel, the prophet Samuel. And uh, it's really a story of, of, of parents and children, of, of, of the, the prayers that parents have for their children, which really comes to the fore Rosh Hashanah when we realize that uh, certain things are important and certain things are trivial. And the uh, nachas and the children, etc., are really of, 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 of paramount importance. And uh, as such, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, pertinent and, and appropriate uh, reading to be, uh, to be set on Rosh Hashanah. The second day is another important message, which is the story of the Akeda, the story of sacrifice. It's really the message of sacrifice and the ultimate sacrifice that Avram and Yitzchak, I mean, both of them were participating in this, uh, in this venture. Uh, parenthetically, we have this notion of Yitzchak being a child as he was taken onto the mountain as an offering. The truth of the matter is Yitzchak was uh, a middle-aged man. I think he was 37 years old at the time. So uh, he was very much part and parcel of uh, this uh, sacrifice and of, uh, of this Akedah. And this is really, I think, one of the important messages of Hashanah as well, 
the need to be willing to give up the sacrifice in order to achieve greatness, in order to achieve what we need to achieve, is no free lunch. If we want to really develop our character and really develop as individuals, we need to sacrifice in certain things in order to achieve something greater. After the reading of the Torah, we have the shofar blowing. Now, the shofar blowing, as I said, on the first day of Rosh Hashanah is not done. On the second day of Rosh Hashanah, we blow the shofar at this point. Um, there are various different verses that are said before. And it's, it's at this point where there are a lot of mystical ideas that the, the sages invoke with respect to the various different passages, the various different psalms and, and verses that are said before. But I think what's most important practically is to hear the shayfa. That's, you know, that's, that, that's the most important point. And to tell your friends, you know, to, to try and hear the shayfa um, and to pay attention to the shayfa. And uh, the Chazar recites the blessing to answer Amen and uh, to, um, to, uh, to really fulfill the primary mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah. You know, Rosh Hashanah has uh, a lot of customs. You know, there's the eating the apple and the honey and uh, the pomegranate. Those are all customs, what they call minhag. There's a hierarchy in Yiddishkeit. There are minhagim, and then there are mitzvahs. The blowing of the shofar is the mitzvah of the day. In fact, the Gemara says, mitzvahs hayayim b'shofar, implying that the mitzvah, the primary mitzvah of the day, is the blowing of the shofar. And we hear no fewer than 30 blasts. Um, I think the... The reason for that is a bit beyond the scope of the discussion today, but we should hear at least a minimum of 30 blasts in order to fulfill the, uh, the, uh, the mitzvah. Okay, at this point, we move on to the Musaf prayer. And if you're coming to Shul, this is going to be the primary uh, prayer that we are going to be doing in Shul. We're not going to be doing Shachras in Shul. We're going to start from Torah reading, Shofar blowing, and then Musaf. So, um, generally, the Musaf prayer on an ordinary Shabbat contains seven blessings. Remember, the Musaf is an Amida, so it contains seven blessings. There is a standard three opening, the standard closing, as we've mentioned earlier in Shacharit. And the middle one is, talks about the, 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 the day, whether it's Shabbat, whether it's Ashkodesh, whether it's the festival. But in Rosh Hashanah, we add three blessings in the middle. So these are, these are three blessings. We're talking about three fundamental themes of the day. The first is called, just, so just if you want to follow along, the, the Amita starts on page 448. You'll see it starts the standard. And then the, 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 the first section of Malchiot start, goes on page, uh, is on page 454. So the first section talks about sovereignty. It talks about um, Hashem as our king. The second section is referred to as zichronot, remembrances. We'll, we'll explain this a bit more in depth. And the third one is shofrot, which are really the three themes of the day. Sovereignty, remembrance, and the sounding of the shofrot. And those are, these, are the, the, these three blessings make up the bulk of the Amidah, and it's quite, it's, it's longer than ordinary Amidah. And it contains the bulk of the, uh, the Musaf prayer. Now, before we explain the meaning, let's just explain a bit the structure. Each of these three blessings include three verses from the Torah, three verses from the prophets, and three verses from the writings, and then a concluding verse from the Torah again for a total of 10 verses. And each of these 10 verses contain the theme of that blessing. So in, in Malchiot, each of the 10 verses contain the word melech, or the theme of sovereignty. So too with zikronot, remembrances, talk about Hashem remembers people, Hashem should remember people. And then shofra, talking about the sound of the shofar. Now, parenthetically, the number 10 is very much connected to Rosh Hashanah, because our, our, the Torah tells us in the book of Genesis, in the book of Bereshit, that Hashem created the world with 10 utterances. The world was created with 10 utterances. So we recite 10 verses to correspond to the 10 utterances with which Hashem created the world on Rosh Hashanah, which we are celebrating. So let's start 
with the first one, with Malchiot, sovereignty. So Rosh Hashanah commemorates the day that Adam Adishan, Adam was created. And it's not just the day of Adam's creation, but Adam had a job to do. And Adam, on the first day of creation, crowned Hashem as king. Because there were actually many other creations that preceded Adam. Adam was, in fact, the last one to be created. The Talmud tells us that God wanted Adam to come into the world like a person comes into a feast. When you come into a feast, hopefully everything is prepared. The caterer did their job. The chairs are there. The tables, everything is prepared. So Adam came into this world after all had been created. So there were animals. There were fish. There were trees. There were even angels. They were all created before Adam. But... There was a fundamental difference between the relationship of all of creation with God and the relationship between Adam and God. The human had a unique relationship that did not exist with all other creation. You see, Hashem can only be a king over subjects. When we talk about a king in Judaism, a king is somebody who is accepted by his subject as a ruler. It's not a dictator. It's not somebody who dominates others. It's somebody who is accepted by the populace, by the subject, as a king. All other creations did not have choice. Animals don't have choice. Even the angels can't choose. They're programmed to behave in a certain way. They can be the servants of God. They can be, if you want to use modern terminology, they can be God's robots. But to be God's subject, you need to have a human being with freedom of choice, who of his or her own volition chooses to accept Hashem as king. And that's in fact what Adam did. Adam recognized that Hashem was the master of the universe. And he in turn found that it felt necessary that all of creation should acknowledge us. And he transformed the first day of creation into God's coronation. So in this blessing, we start off by reciting verses expressing our gratitude that Hashem established this relationship with humanity and that he gave us the ability to choose him as king. And we conclude this blessing with uh, an expression of hope and, in fact, confidence that the day will come when all the nations of the world will recognize this reality. Hashem will reign over the entire universe. So that is Malchiot, that is the first section of the Musa prayer, of the, of, the, of the three blessings in the middle of the Musa prayer, which starts at page 454, and it finishes on page 458. Then we continue with Zichronot, remembrances. Now as king, uh, Hashem judges how loyal we are, uh, you know, to Him throughout the year. But Hashem is the, you know, is the God of mercy, and He remembers us and He judges us. But um, He judges us in a merciful way. You know, Hashem knows not only what we did, but He also knows our challenges. He also knows our motives. He knows the difficulties that we've experienced. It's one thing for somebody to judge you when they don't know what may have motivated you to behave in a certain way. They don't know what's going on within you. They don't know your personal challenges. But when Hashem, who knows what's going on within you, and He judges you, it's a very different type of judgment. It's a loving judgment. It's a judgment of mercy. And Hashem remembers not just our deeds, but He remembers all that went on that preceded our deeds, all that goes on within our minds, within our hearts, within our very being. And... Not only does he remember that, but he also remembers the merits, the schuyot, our ancestors. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And in this blessing, we ask Hashem not only to remember us and our deeds, but also to remember those who come before us. And we ask Hashem to remember um, the righteous acts of our ancestors. And we conclude this blessing with the words, Hashem, we, we, we bless Hashem, Baruch um, Hashem, Zoycher Abris, who remembers his covenant. He remembers the covenant that he made with our people, the challenges that we've gone through throughout history. And we ask Hashem that even if in our schus, we may not, even, even if we as individuals don't have the merit to be uh, inscribed for a good year, at least, at least in the schus of our ancestors, we should be inscribed and sealed for a good year. And finally, the third one is the sound is shofrot, which begins on page 462. 
the last of the third. The shoifer blasts, they signify the coronation of the king in ancient times. In fact, even today, when they, when they make, uh, during the coronation, they blow the trumpets and it announces the arrival of the king. And um, on Rosh Hashanah, we're, you know, crowning Hashem. That's, in fact, one of the reasons why we blow the shoifer. The common reason, the well-known reason, is the shoifer is supposed to arouse us to do tshuva. But another reason given is that the shoifer recalls the idea of, of, of coronation, that when you crown a king, you blow the shoifer. And in fact, the Medrash says that how do we crown Hashem? Through blowing the shoifer. So the, 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 the shoifer are very much associated with the idea of coronation. Additionally, the sounding of the shoifer reminds us of um, two of the greatest events in history. One that happened and one that will happen. The one that happened is the giving of the title. We're told that when the, when the title was given in Mount Sinai, it was accompanied with the sounding of the shoifer. So on Rosh Hashanah, we invoke the memory <clears throat> of that shoifer on Mount Sinai and uh, reminding Hashem and don't forget, uh, you know, where we accepted the Taylor, you know, we, uh, we willingly accepted the Taylor, and uh, we ask you to, uh, to reciprocate and to, you know, to, to repay us in kind, essentially. So the blowing of the shoifer invokes, you, you know, that, that, that event. And it also is very much associated with the coming of Mashiach. It says the Mashiach comes, we'll blow the great shoifer for our redemption. So we recite these verses describing the sounding of the Shefa at the revelation at, at Mount Sinai, as well as the coming of Mashiach, really as a recollection of the past and a prayer for the future for the final redemption. So we have Malthus, coronation, the Chreinus, remembrances, and Shefris. Um, one of the great 15th century um, philosophers, Rabbi Yosef Albo, he wrote a great book, Sefer Iknim on philosophy. He explains that these three blessings are an expression of the most basic principles of Jewish faith. He says, we start with Malthus, which reminds us of the existence and the absolute sovereignty of Hashem, which is, you know, principle number one, foundation number one of Judaism. Zechreinu, it reminds us that Hashem knows and remembers all of our actions, which is also an important principle that Hashem is aware of what goes on in, uh, in this world. And Shofrot reminds us of the truth and the eternity of the Torah, which is the tool that Hashem has given us to navigate, to navigate this world. So on, on Rosh Hashanah, we emphasize these three fundamental principles of Yiddishkeit as the foundation of our year, in fact, the foundation of, uh, of, our, uh, of our life. So these are really three important principles, three important blessings, and that is the essence of the, um, of the, uh, of the Musaf prayer on Rosh Hashanah. And once again, when this is done in a minion, the repetition of the Amidah is quite, quite long. There are additional prayers that are inserted, and I once again recommend that you read through some of them um, just to uh, familiarize yourself with them. And I want to conclude with one final um, one final discussion about the prayer of Unetane Tokev. Now, this is probably the most well-known prayer of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, it's included in the repetition of the Amidah, but for those who are not going to be in Shul, um, and not going to be down with the Minyan, I'd recommend you say it after the Amidah. You can just say the Unetane Tokev, read it in Hebrew or in English. And uh, it's really a, a powerful, uh, um, a, 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 a powerful testament to the Jewish perspective on, uh, on life. And the Unasana Toka prayer has a very interesting history. Um, in your machzer on the bottom, I'm not going to repeat the story, but there is uh, the well-known story of Rab Abnon of Mainz, one of the great Jewish leaders who uh, was, he was, uh, he was asked to, to convert and ultimately he refused and he was then killed by uh, the Bishop of Mainz. Before he died, he recited this prayer. So this wasn't a prayer that was initially formulated for Rosh Hashanah, at least not the beginning of it, but this became part of the Rosh Hashanah prayer and the Kippur prayer. 
And it's really a prayer with three scenes, if you will. The first uh, section of the prayer, really, it, 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 it sets the scene. You know, the heavenly court is assembled. Hashem is uh, on a seat of judgment. The angels are trembling. And there is the book of all our deeds that are open. And uh, our lives are written down. You know, we're waiting for the verdict. That is the first of the uh, scenes of the Yonatan Uh Just to, to give you the, um, sorry, to give you the, uh, the uh, page number. It's on page... 538. So it's really a beautiful description of what's going on in the spiritual realms on this day. That's the first section, the first, uh, the first act. The second act really defines what's at stake here. You know, good, a lot of action, a lot of interesting happenings, but what's, what's at stake? And the author writes, who will live, who will die, who will flourish, who will suffer, who will be at ease. So between now and Yom Kippur, all of these are at stake. This is what's at stake at this all-important time. Our fate is being decided by, uh, by God Almighty. And then comes the grand finale, which is really the hallmark uh, of, of Yiddishkeit, which, which really embodies how Yiddishkeit is a religion of hope. It's a religion of empowerment. A religion that tells the individual, you matter as a person. Because the author concludes and says, a person's fate is not final. Nothing is decreed. Because you as an individual can change. You can change yourself and in turn change your reality and change your destiny. Tshuva utfila utstaka ma'avirin etroa hagzed. Repentance, prayer, and charity can avert the evil decree. Life is not some sort of script, you know, God wrote down, this is what you're going to do today, this is what you're going to do tomorrow, this is going to happen to you, no. Those choices were given to you. That was put in your hands. It's not some sort of uh, play that uh, some author wrote where, you know, the end is foretold. Hashem forgives, Hashem pardons, Hashem says, you turn to me if you repent and you are sincere in your transformation, then I in turn will repay you in kind. And this is, is really the essence of what Yiddishkeit is about, the empowering message. You know, it's almost a shift in this prayer. You read in the beginning and you're trembling, you know, you're, 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 you're looking at the individual and you're looking how frail, how frail you are and how, how vulnerable you are. Standing before God Almighty, you know, who can stand? before Hashem Rosh Hashanah. We all know what we did. We all know how our year was. It could have been a bit better. And in an instant, it, it's transformed in sort of an outburst. The crowd joins together and yells at once, because this is what this guy is all about. It's about that transformation, that recognition, that however, you know, however, however finite, however small, however limited we think we are, we need to recognize that we're far greater than that. That Hashem has empowered us with the ability to transform not only ourselves, not only the community, but together we can transform the world at large. So that really covers um, the, the prayers in a nutshell. I know some people would have hoped that the whole service would be that short, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, that, uh, that, 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 that's all for, for tonight. Really, these are the essential, the key prayers of Rosh Hashanah. And if you could add, if you could, you know, go through the master and, and you know, uh, incorporate other ones, I think it's really, it's really beautiful. It's an opportunity to maybe take it a bit slower than you would ordinarily and really make this Rosh Hashanah a meaningful and a powerful one, one that uh, will be transformative for us as individuals. So thank you all for, for joining us. And I want to wish you all to be inscribed and sealed for a happy and healthy, wonderful new year. I just want to thank you, Roy Simpson. Thank you very much you, for you. all of the insights and the details. So not about everyone. Please book for your place in the in services if you're coming to Shul the afternoon on Sunday for the show for blowing can include children. So if it's uh, necessary to bring the children and uh, you're able to, please book with the Shul. Tomorrow night at 7.30, we have the pre-Rosh Hashanah online service. 
We've got some very beautiful pieces that will get us into the mood of Rosh Hashanah. Please join us. And next week, Wednesday night, Rabbi Simpson will be giving a class on the preparation for Yom Kippur. And we do have a time, and the time is at 7.15 next week. So we'll make sure everybody knows next week, Wednesday night, 7.15. Shana Tova Umetukak. Tiba B'chati Matova. God bless. Thank you, and good. Thank you, Rabbi Simpson. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi.